you know, when you're young, you're, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about myself. So, you know, in your 20s, you almost feel like you shouldn't say, I don't know, or um, you feel, sh- you know, I don't know if shy is the right word, but you feel like you're disadvantaged if you have a public display of like not knowing something. Well, right. what you realize as you get a bit older, and I think is super, super important, there's a lot of power, a lot of power in saying, I don't know. And I think one of the things I remember hearing, you know, from somebody, you know, again, maybe 20 years ago, hey man, like you're going to be an expert. You just need to know like 1% more than the next person to be quote unquote an expert. I hate that. I think that's totally, (laughs) that's just totally false, man. Like there's so much to learn and there's so many amazing experiences out there to learn from and people and, you know, writings and books that it's actually a gift not to know. And to, wow. and the more you say that, like, and I do it now, like I, I'll do it with my team. I'll do it with my sons Man, I'll do it every day. Like, I, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Right. Let me, let me, let me, let me think about that. I don't know what else to tell you guys, man. Big time entrepreneurs make big time podcasts. Shout out to all the Who fans out there. Listen, today, as you can probably tell, we had Drew Green from Indochino on. Drew is a monster entrepreneur, maybe one of the best, biggest, most successful entrepreneurs and CEOs we've had on the ThinkSpace podcast. Um, Yeah, Chief Executive Officer, President, Director of Indochino. Indochino is literally the fastest, largest, quickest growing uh, online retailer there is in the world taking a you know they innovated a whole business and drew took it over in 2015 uh, as he calls it in a restart and it's literally six x the company uh, since then now they have you know over i think 55 or 60 showrooms across the across north america and uh, they're growing incredibly drew raised over a hundred million dollars uh, in long-term capital a hundred million that's a huge number um and he's formed strategic partnerships with huge brands, you know, whether that's brands over in China, whether that's post media, um, various other venture partners. And he's really gone big fast. Uh, he's, you know, uh, an entrepreneur of the year by Ernest and Young. Like he's very, has very high credentials and uh, is very well recognized. So I don't have to, uh, I'll, I won't overstate that anymore. But what we talked about in this conversation was about, yeah, about business, but more about philosophy, his way of thinking, how he approaches parenthood and what his priorities are, how he goes into decision-making processes, how he segments and compartmentalizes his day, and how he goes about leading this team, what actually matters to him. So really getting inside the head of one of the most successful entrepreneurs on the planet Um very exciting and it's not just his success is not limited to one company you know he's been a part of whether it's a shareholder a founder um a board member an executive of 25 companies that have been in in industries across the board so this guy is someone who goes out and gets it done continuously so incredibly incredibly grateful to have him on drew thank you so much here's our conversation Okay, we're live. Mr. Drew Green, welcome to the Think Space Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really freaking appreciate it. Joining us from a home office. Uh, You know what? I am in the office. Um, The office. Yeah, our headquarters here in Vancouver and just in my office uh, for this really exciting uh, window of time with you today. So appreciate you having me on and, and so thank you very much. I love it, man. First things first for all the video, uh, for all the video listeners and people who are out there on YouTube. What is in the background here? Because it seems like some some big time stuff. We got the National Post, various news, uh, you know, news publications. We have signed T-shirts. What's going on here? Yeah, there's you know a lot of a lot of things uh, are going on here. Um, You know, full scope, a a bit of a spinorama, but. you know, in front of me, I've got all the the major uh, you know partnerships that we've signed through the years, uh, signed by our partners and myself. So you know, Diang, uh, Post Media, Mitsui, Yankees, R.J. Barrett, and on and on and on. And I think the company's had about three thousand uh, articles written over writ- written about the company. Wow! Uh, over the last five years, and so I've just picked some of 
my more favorite ones. So, you know, in the New York Times, uh, Globe and Mail, Esquire, GQ, uh, and on and on. And, uh, and then some, you know, some personal stuff like those two, uh, pictures of Popeye and, uh, up there in the corner, those are, uh, pieces of art. I bought my son in Tribeca when we lived there and I'm a huge Yankees uh, fan and supporter. And so you got some of the guys who came in to get suited, signed some t-shirts for my, or some, some dress shirts for my sons. That's pretty damn cool. Uh, Indochino <laughs> has done some major partnerships. Some people uh, in the world say that that's been a huge, a huge keystone in how you guys have scaled to the level that you've scaled because you've done these incredible strategic partnerships. But we'll get into all that a little bit later. What I love, if from your point of view as someone that's manned Indochino, which is so much more than you know the largest custom apparel and fastest growing custom apparel company in the world, what 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 is Indochino to you on like a, on a massive scale? What does it mean to you? How is it developed, and how is it positioned now in your life? Yeah, I think it's I think so. It's such a good question. I, I think for for me, you know, it's the same thing it was when I when I contemplated you know coming on board and and you know have kind of referred to as restarting the business. I think. You know, I saw an opportunity to inspire um, a generation, you know, a generation of men, um, you know, to dress for their weddings, their big date, uh, their first job or their fifth job, um, you know, for a family event or, or, or anywhere in between. And that word inspire is really meaningful to me. I've, I've tried to live a life uh, that is inspired and you know, again, when I looked at the opportunity with Indochino and sort of turning a, a niche brand into what's now, you know, becoming a global brand, uh, that opportunity to inspire uh, through our product, um, through our partnerships, through our people, um, through our, the experience that we deliver uh, really meant a lot to me. And, and I think powered a lot of, you know, my 70 hour weeks in, 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 in helping, you know, work alongside the, the, the hundreds, if not thousands of people that have helped build this brand. So totally, man. Yeah. I mean, a wearing a suit is just a different type of feeling. Empowerment is a different type of feeling. I think you being able to empower, um, yeah, like your everyday Joe, but also on a level, it's very interesting as I see you've worked with, you know, these major megastar athletes, RJ Barrett comes to mind. When I see him and when you formed your partnership, which is not where I want to go with this conversation, but so interesting just as a reflection at that point in which you guys, you know, really formed your partnership when he was with New York and these different types of things, you really saw RJ Barrett take a step in maturity. Mm. Is that is that is that is there when you work with your with your stars or your sponsorships or your partners, what 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 is your relationship with them outside of whatever's on the contract? How do you treat partners, whether that's stars like R.J. Barrett or larger organizations like uh, Postmates? Yeah, I think uh, so. Really good observations there. I think for me, um, you know, one of the really important things that I've always kind of lived by is you know, everybody, you treat everybody the same. So whether you're a, you know, a budding NBA star, you own the Yankees or, you know, you're helping organize and clean up the office. Um, you know, I think you, you'll find you get treated the same way, uh, for me and, and, and my family, my boys, that's, that's the way we live. I think for, for RJ, that's an interesting, um, you know, observation. I, I don't know that we can take any credit uh, as he's maturing as a man, and as a, as a player, but everything we do has kind of a story to it. Um, really, really does. And, 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 a, and to me, a meaningful story that, uh, you know, is important in terms of that word inspiration um, or, you know, some of the values that, that we and I hold dearly, you know, RJ, uh, his father, uh, I've known now for uh, a long time, 30 years, Wow. Probably more than 30 years, actually. He used to dunk on me when I was, when I was uh, a oh, young yeah. man. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, but we grew up in Scarborough together uh, in the same neighborhood, Kingston Galloway, which, um, you know, is a pretty underprivileged, pretty rough uh, part of the city. Um, 
you know, and I always, I, you know, I didn't know Rowan that well. Uh, he was a couple years older than me. Um, unbelievable athlete, but I always kind of looked across, you know, the court and I just, you know, even as a young man, I just remember, wow, this is, this is a, this is a dude that, you know, super talented, but there's just something different about him. He, he, you know, he works hard. He doesn't take his talents for granted. Um, and of course, you know, Rowan went on to do some, some really great things. And then now is, you know, running the national team. Um, so it kind of started there, right? Like my, my, my respect, I would say for Rowan, uh, sort of led me to see if there was something we could do with the family. And it's always, you know, a partnership is always more than one person. Um, you know, and so our partnership with RJ, I can, I kind of figure, you know, it, it, I kind of look at it as, as more of a partnership with the family. And, wow. you know, we've been really lucky. We saw a lot of uh, greatness in RJ, not just on the court, but, you know, he's somebody that's always held himself to a high standard off the court. Um, and we just, you know, we're really enjoying uh, the relationship. And, and frankly, I think, you know, the best is yet to come. So um, it's just a special, it's a special partnership that we're really grateful to, to have. Totally. You talk a lot about, you know, family, kids, your boys coming up, are obviously incredibly important to you. Uh, I love seeing all the, the summertime hustling, by the way, <laughs> out here. Summer is very serious. It is. Um, especially in COVID. Uh, you spend, you, you seem to spend so much time with your kids. You seem to be working 80 hour works at uh, work days. I got to ask selfish question. How the heck do you structure your days, man? Because that's something I struggle with and a lot of our listeners struggle with. So I think it's a few things. I think, it, you know, having your priorities is really important. So, you know, my number one priority is and will always be, you know, my, my kids and my family. And having that sort of firm number one priority, I think, is important, right? Because you can make decisions around it. Do you go for that business dinner or do you, you know, make it a breakfast or, or a lunch or a coffee? Um you know, and so having a priority and having your priorities is really important. Um, I think two other things that are really important to me, and I, you know, there's a lot more that I manage than, than meets the eye uh, in terms of, you know, all the things that we're involved in, but, you know, very scheduled. So, you know, I'm up very early. Um, I go to bed super early now at this, at this stage in my uh, business life. And I'm disciplined that way. And, and so I start very early in the morning. Um, when I do something, this is the third thing that I think is really important for, for everyone. When I'm doing something, so I'm right now I'm you know, doing this podcast with you, that's all I'm thinking about. And that's right. super, super important when you've got a lot to do or a lot going on or a lot of responsibilities or accountabilities or, or, or are involved and have, are passionate about a lot of different things. And so, you know, it could only be a half an hour call in the day, but whatever that subject matter is, I'm totally in that subject matter. I don't, you know, check my phone. I don't think about my next meeting. I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm, I'm present. And I think that's really important. Um, so yeah. How, how do you train that? Because for me, it's just, I mean, I've actually, I'm going through programs and whatnot, try to, you know, reconstruct my brain into being orientated one task at a time because monotasking has proven to just be inefficient and, and running backwards. You yeah. know, like when, when I'm, when you're in a situation like you are, like you said, you're managing much more than meets the eye, multiple different companies and advisories and boards and kids and all that. For you to just so like simply be here on a podcast is a feat in itself. What's what are the the mental and psychological mechanisms, tricks, or whatever it is that you I don't know play on yourself or orientate yourself to actually be here? Because for me, I get drawn everywhere constantly. So, man, you you're you're you've got so many great questions here. So I think. Um, and I just want to think about it a little bit because I didn't get any of these questions ahead of time, which I love. Um, I think there's a few things. I remember as a kid, uh, you know, certain people would say that I compartmentalize things too much. And I actually think that that's really helped me, right? So compartmentalization, uh, maybe it can be a negative to some people. To me, it's a really important part of who I am and what I do. And so, 
you know, again, when I'm doing something, if it's shooting with my son, I'm shooting with my son, right? And it makes, you know, if you've got an hour to do that, uh, some people will spend five hours, but it won't be quality because they'll be doing 10 other things. And so, so again, I really think that's important. The other thing that I adopted, man, maybe 25 years ago or more is just, I'm very goal oriented. And so, you know, even this morning, and I can't show you it, nor would I, but, you know, I've got a spreadsheet that's literally 25 years old. It's now, you know, multiple tabs and really long in length, but it tracks all my goals. And so really? not only do I write down my goals and type, type them, but I update them daily. And every morning when I wake up, I kind of go through my checklist of, you know, things that I want to accomplish. And so I think being goal oriented, some people disagree, but I think goal oriented, being goal oriented is super important, but don't be afraid to track them and don't be afraid to fail because you're not always going to achieve every goal you set. Sometimes an original goal will lead you to a new goal, right? And, but you've got to track and you've got to write down and, and even before I go to bed, I do it, right? So I think about the next day, I think about what some of the things I want to accomplish and, you know, uh, we, we get after it, man. And, and I, the same, it's the same way I run a company. I mean, when we, as a management team, we meet every day for an hour, uh, prior to that. So that's executive management, the leadership team, you know, what's their number one priority for the day? What was it yesterday? What are some victories? So I want people to enjoy the experience because that is the destination. That is the treasure. Um, and what are some rocks? So how can I help you? Like what, what's going on in your world that's tough and how can your team, you know, kind of pick you up? And so I, I kind of, you know, that's the way we run a company, but that's also the way I run my, run my life. So hopefully that answers structure, structure. That's, that's, that's grip. That's gripping because I had listened in some of your previous interviews and you had said that initially one of the, I won't say goals, but maybe the intentions or the reasons why you went towards entrepreneurship. Um, would you call yourself an, a serial entrepreneur? I don't like the word serial. Right. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I think a serial killer or I think of <laughs> Lucky Charms. I don't, I don't got know. It, got it, got it, got it. We're not sweet and fruity over here. We're getting no, down to business. Oh, exactly. Got it, got it. I don't know. But, cereal uh, just seems, cereal also seems laissez-faire. Right. I, I like, you know, committed entrepreneur or, you know, dedicated entrepreneur. Cereal just seems too flaky or, or free for me. Off the riff. I get yeah, it. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Cool, cool, cool. Um, but what I was saying is that, uh, you know, you had mentioned that freedom was one of the most important things and one of the reasons why you went towards entrepreneurship. And that's cool. That's great. As a young person, I can relate to that. A lot of our listeners can relate to that. But one of the, one of the key points that came to my mind when you said that is, okay, well, Drew values freedom. He values being his own boss. He, he values growing and managing a team. I wonder now... Does he feel a sense of freedom with all of the obligations and commitments that you have? How do you still remain free when you're as successful and as committed as you are? Um, so I think, you know, maybe just to go back to, to, to the origin of that. So the one thing I think is really important for, for your listeners or, or for people as they think about their career, or think about their entrepreneurial journey you know, I recently had a, um, a call him uh, someone I know uh, versus a family member, or a close friend, someone I know, uh, really, really talented person. Uh, they lost their job. Wow. And, you know, this is a high paying job, something they've gone to school, I think, eight, nine years for. Um, and it came as a surprise, right? Because this is a really talented individual. And you know, now he wants to start a company, which he's going to do, and I'm going to help him do. Um, it, 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 the point being is that whether you are an entrepreneur, quote unquote, and you've started a business or you're partnered and are working to build a business, which I also consider an entrepreneur, um, the risks are the same. The risks are the same, right? Everybody has the, the sort of the fallacy that, okay, if I get a nine to five, quote unquote, job, uh, which I don't think any jobs now are nine to five. Um, 
you know, I'm safe, right? Because I've got a paycheck coming. It's a big company. Um, you know, they're making money, all these things versus a startup or mid cap or even a large cap high growth company. The ri risks are the same, I think, no matter what. I really do. I mean, I, I get the point of, you know, taking out loans or leveraging your house to start a company, all those stories. But at the end of the day, you're going to risk is risk. And so, you know, how, how do you deal with risk? How do you deal with stress? Um, those are really, really important skill sets, I think, in life. Um, and especially if you're going to be sort of a quote unquote entrepreneur, because frankly, every day is stressful. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, you know, to me, you know, business is all business is, is really solving problems. That's what it is. If you're mm -hmm. starting a company, you've recognized, you know, something in the market that you can make better. So you're solving a problem. And then when you get into it, whether it's, you know, uh, administrative or a bigger issue, every day you're kind of solving problems. And that's, and that's what business is. That's what building businesses is. And, uh, and super, super important. So I don't know if that answers your question in, in, in totality, but, but some of my thoughts around it. I like it. Do you still feel a sense of freedom at this stage in your life? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, you know, so, and I'm sorry, cause you did use that word and I didn't refer to it directly. So freedom to me is not money related, although you can have, you know, more freedom, uh, the more, um, you know, the more money you have, frankly, but it can also become a burden, right? And so how you look at things and what you, how you define freedom is super important, right? For me, freedom is, working with the people I want to work with, uh, working on the things that I'm passionate about, that's freedom, right? And, and freedom is not retirement. Like, right. I don't even know yeah. what freedom, you know, I've tried, I tried retiring uh, once in my late 30s, uh, just before I turned 40. And that lasted like a couple months, because that's, that's not freedom, right? right. Freedom is doing, I, I, for me, the definition of freedom is doing the things that you that bring you the most joy and happiness and frankly doing them with people that, you know, you admire or are inspired by. And, uh, you know, I've been in situations where I've been working with people that don't in inspire me, um, that I don't right. admire. And I try to get out of those situations. Right. right. Uh, yeah. Because that's not freedom. So that is a eloquent answer and beautifully put. I love it. Um, that's got me fired up. Part of the reason I asked that question is because I define freedom not in how much money I have. Yeah, a little bit where my time goes, but more where my mind is. Um, and, yeah. and what meant, am I completely consumed? Am I being driven without my um, consent mentally or things, stressors or whatever it is? Or is my thinking being directed in a certain way without me knowing? Yeah. So, I'm curious from, from your perspective, we're now in an age where information is absolutely everywhere. everywhere. It's hectic. Yeah. Um, what do you allow to be your information inputs? How do you filter out what you pay attention to, who you pay attention to? Because for me, if I'm not free in my thoughts, I can't be free anywhere else. Such, yeah, man. Yeah. And, 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 as I, as he asked the question, as I think about the answer, like, I think it's a super important thing to think about. I don't know that I have the right, you know, the right approach, but with the rise of social media, as an example, I do think you need to be careful, you know, what you, what you read and what you, you know, take in, so to speak for me, social media are time capsules. I adopted that, you know, 10 years ago where, you know, if you weren't went to my Facebook page, it's really going to be a time capsule for my kids. That, that's 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 great. It. That's incredible. Uh, Instagram, sort of same thing. LinkedIn, to a lesser extent. Um, you know, but but all three are time capsules, and I don't. You know, I try not to uh, seek my knowledge through those channels. Uh, right. And frankly, as a father, you know, I've, I've got two high performance athletes as sons. I think one of the dangerous things for them is, you know, that sort of the comparison vice, uh, you know, that social media can really impose on them, which 
you know, they see a video, a 30 second video of a kid that's their age and it, he's doing awesome things, but they're not kind of realizing that's 30 seconds of a 30 minute game or whatever, where right. there was also multiple mistakes and, you know, all kinds of stuff that went on. So, you know, I think you just have to be careful. I think for me, what I really, really rely on is again, um, organizing my thoughts probably mostly through my email. Hmm, that really? might sound okay. weird, but like everything in my life is organized through like I, people love to text people love to IG message. I really, really value my inbox and organizing what I, what flows in and what flows out through my inbox, including information, which could be, you know, anything from setting a breakfast meeting, uh, where I'll learn a ton to, you know, to an article, um, that somebody sent me that I, that I find interesting or important to something that, you know, either at the time or in the future will be important to me. So, you know, I don't, um, and then the sort of third leg of that would just be, you know, the rise of, of, of search, right? I mean, you can literally, I was helping my son with his homework last night and I was so close to just like, I couldn't, I didn't have the answer to the question, which was way complex question for a grade seven. Um, and my, you know, my hand started going to my computer to do a search. Yeah, 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 and I yeah. know I could find the answer like in a minute. <laughs> that's not homework, right? And so, uh -huh. you know, making sure that you don't get into that habit, I think is also important. However, what an awesome time to be alive, right? Like, really. like think about all the things I, my dad, you know, my mom, uh, were both educators and, you know, I think 50 years ago, you kind of chose your career, you chose your, your path and you'd learn about that and you'd master that. But with, in the day that we live now, like you can know so much about so many things and that's awesome. Like that's how so great awesome. is that? That's like living, you know, that's like living five lives, yeah. right? Like really over the course of your hundred years on the planet, all the things that you can, you can learn about and, you know, become kind of a quote unquote expert in, uh, right. I think is really cool. We're, we're really lucky. We are so lucky. I mean, but trying to manage that, right. Everything is a gift and a curse. There's two sides to everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and I, I get away with me personally, people will ask me things and I will just sound very confident even though I maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can figure it out on the go or whatever. Yeah. And, and I've actually gotten in the habit of, of bullshitting too much of being too confident and, and cause I'm uncomfortable with saying, no, I don't know. Right. And then there's also the, the whole fact of information is coming to us in such a way where, you know, it's, I think Naval Ravikant said this, where it's like, don't, don't give me the lecture. Give me the book. Don't give me the book. Give me the blog post. Don't give me the blog post. Give me the podcast. Don't give me the podcast. Give me the tweet. In fact, I already know. Don't tell me at all. Right. Yeah. And it, and that is cool, but it's troublesome because as a, as a young person and an entrepreneur, I'm trying to constantly evaluate what's happening in the world, what's coming next, what's important, what's not. Yeah. And I imagine for someone in, in your position who's already built gargantuan companies, where the world is going, what is happening and what is not happening, what is real news and what is fake news is probably very, very important. Which leads me to my next question, which is, I said I, said I wouldn't talk too much about uh, Indochino and all that, but it's still so top of mind. I'm infinitely curious um, whether it was early on with shop or whether it's Indochino now, it's 2020, Mr. Drew Green. Where can we expect your energy and efforts to go in the next few years? Because now I'm just, uh, there's so much. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I mean, that's, uh, I've, got, I've got some uh, really, really interesting plans. I would say for the next 20 years, I don't think in increments of six months or 18 months um, too often beyond... Yeah you know, what's, what's going on right now and what we have. I mean, there's definitely an amazing 18 months ahead of us at Indochino. Uh, we're working on some things right now that has, have got me, you know, more excited than ever, uh, that can, as big as we are and as far as we've come, you know, really create a legacy brand globally. 
And so we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can get these things done here in the, in the coming sort of, I'd say six months and then we'll be on our way. You know, I've got very specific goals that I want to achieve. I think in the next sort of five years, uh, four or five years around some of the things I'm involved in it goes back to my number one priority. I, I, I'd love to see both my sons, you know, attend university and, and, you know, get properly positioned for following the dreams that they have, which are very clear and very well articulated by them. Um, and then I've got this, I've got this thing I want to do that I'm not going to talk about today. Oh. Uh, that I oh. think is going to be uh, something that has never been done in Canada before that is going to uh, leave an indelical mark on, on, on Canadian life and perhaps people globally in a very, very cool way. Uh, but it's a 20 year, even 25 year, uh, goal that I'm working on now, you know, okay. I had a meeting on it last week with, with some of my partners and the, and a firm we're engaged with on it. And, uh, yeah, but that's going to be pretty exciting. And that's, you know, for me, that's something I, I want my sons closely involved with at, you know, whatever stage, yeah. Um, but you know what, man, you said something earlier. I don't want to let go of, cause I think it's super important. You know, that, that notion of saying, I don't know. Ah, super, super, super important. And I realize, and I know, you know, when you're young, you're, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about myself. So, you know, in your twenties, you almost feel like you shouldn't say, I don't know, or, um, you feel, sh you know, I don't know if shy is the right word, but you feel like you're disadvantaged if you have a public display of like not knowing something. Well, right. what you realize as you get a bit older and I think is super, super important. There's a lot of power, a lot of power in saying, I don't know. And I think one of the things I remember hearing, you know, from somebody, you know, again, maybe 20 years ago. Hey man, like you're going to be an expert. You just need to know like 1% more than the next person to be quote unquote an expert. I hate that. I think that's totally, <laughs> that's just totally false, man. Like yeah. you, there's so much to learn and there's so many amazing experiences out there to learn from and people and, you know, writings and books that it's actually a gift not to know. And to, wow. and the more you say that, like, and I do it now, like I, I'll do it with my team. I'll do it with my sons Man, I'll do it every day. Like, I, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. Right. Let me, let me, let me, let me think about that. Um, and that's probably what I do most is I don't know. Let me think about that. And there's a lot of power in that, right? Because yeah. I, I think there's, you know, the bullshit meter is pretty high. And the social media right is now. at an all time high, my friend. <laughs> it's, it's at an all time high. So I think the last thing you want to do is follow that trend and, you know, try to spout off something that you don't know. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Let me think about that. I don't know. What do you think? Right. There's a lot of power in that. Man, I, I love that so much. That's just like encouraged <laughs> me to like continue to to use that. Another one that's been really helpful for me is if I'm sitting in a room with people, now I'm 23, yeah. right? If I'm sitting in a room with people that are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, like I work in, in wealth management, so I'm, I'm always the youngest person in the room. Yeah. And so a lot of times if people know that I'm an extrovert, I like to talk. And sometimes people will say, hey, uh, Joss, you're being a little quiet. Do you have any thoughts to contribute? And and normally in the past I would have been like oh absolutely and just start rattling off stuff yeah. like you know stuff that they already know because yeah. they've already done it they've been there but instead rather than that actually using that opportunity to go well no actually I'm just really um, excited and, and taking the opportunity to hear the experts speak and not wasting airtime on you know saying stuff that we we probably already know and and it's really humbling to be in this conversation I'm just sitting in that yeah. And, and, and I was like that, I said that naturally one time and I got a call after the meeting and they were like, Hey, that was incredibly powerful. I never would have thought you would have said that. Yeah. And so it's just great to hear you say something, you know, along those lines as well. So thank you for that. That, that actually hit home. Well, no, wow. that's yeah. And I'll just, cause I've always been that guy. I've always been the youngest in the room up until a transition is happening where I'm, 
you know, not necessarily the oldest in the room, but I'm, I'm kind of in the middle or, or getting there. And, and I even think, you know, again, I work with so many young entrepreneurs and I only say young because that's the fact they're in their, their first or second venture, not necessarily to do with their age. Um, but I just find a lot of power in like, not necessarily always telling them my view on things and really making sure that it is, it's, 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 it's a communication where they think about what their view of it is. Right. Cause as somebody that's experienced a lot and, you know, uh, has gone through a lot, I could sure answer, you know, a lot of these questions, but I, I do like pausing meetings and making sure that, you know, we hear, we hear different people's view and, and it's an interesting transition going from, you know, sort of youngest in the room, um, man, like I can remember being in board meetings in New York or in California in the Valley in my twenties. And, you know, uh, just the, the, the enormity of the people in the room. Um, and, but what a gift, right? Like I just learned so much because frankly, even at that time, I didn't, I didn't try to, you know, I didn't, I didn't know it all. So I didn't try to act like I knew it all. I wanted to learn, man. And that's, that's super important. Man, that's like ah, still having that beginner's mindset, that learning mindset. At um, you know, after your you know whatever number of business venture this is for you is is freaking incredible. Like, I'm my my business partner is in his sixties, and so I'm a successor, and his ability to ask questions is in freaking incredible. Like, yeah. not just yeah. like the questions. Like someone every time someone asks a question, oh my god, that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that is like the greatest skill. And just to, to double back on what you're just saying about being in board meetings and and being the youngest in the room, I've always been in the situation where that that is the situation. Right. And I will always say, oh, someone passed the torch to me. I better go. I better yeah, say yeah, something. Yeah. I better impress. I better go. And now I'm thinking about, well, okay, what if you know I'm sitting in a podcast with Drew Green or I'm sitting with whoever and, and they ask me a question and I actually just sit in it yeah. and use the, I don't know, I'm not sure, I can follow up with you and get back to you on that. Yeah. Because everyone is so used to bullshitting now. It's almost like you can differentiate yourself by going the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. Cool yeah. And, and you're going to, you, you, like, I often find, like, if, you, if, you're, if you're asked something or, you know, you're asked to give an opinion on something and you're not quite like, you're not quite there yet. It's, it's really important to take that step back and to think about it. Right. Cause mm-hmm. your answer in 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours after thinking it through, like it's always going to be better. Totally. Totally. It always no, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Like so, on, um, uh, Kanye West did this, uh, gave a bunch of interviews right. maybe a year ago. Yeah. And he, they'd ask him questions and he would just, Pregnant pause, hold his face. Yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah. On national iHeart radio stations. Yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah. Crazy stuff. And I just admired that so, so much. So it's, 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 it's rewired my thinking a little bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I really want to get into while I have you on the line here, Drew, is when I'm looking at your businesses, your life, your boys, the whole shebang. I look at this guy and I go, man, what an incredibly successful businessman. What, what a clearly, deeply philosophical, yet on the surface level seem completely engulfed in business. And I want to ask him, well, which one of those two assumptions did I get wrong? Was it the, was it the deeply philosophical or was it the completely laser-focused businessman in which one of those two identities you relate more to or see yourself in? I, I definitely think it's the philosophical, um, you know, description or abstract. I, you, the, and anything in life, whether you have the goal of, you know, playing at the highest level in a sport or running a business or starting a business, focus is just like a given. Like, yeah, you have to, you have to figure that out and and it is a part of it is the a part of the competition set like I, I do believe the more you can focus in on on the goals that you have and the things that are required to achieve those goals that's just a that's kind of blocking and tackling you have to have that i think for right. me 
You know, look, man, I've been in some really interesting situations and I've, what I'm most proud of, you know, is I've always tried to hold, hold, hold my ground to what I believe in. And, um, you know, if I've made a mistake, I always admit to it. If I believe that something is not right or not being done right or being done underhanded, quote unquote, or, or so to speak, you know, I just don't let, I don't let that go. And so having very, very clear view of what's important to me, I, I think there's, you know, I've got a company that's going public, uh, you know, in the next month or so. And, um, you know, it's going to be a great success. It's high, high growth. It's one of the fastest growing companies in Canada, profitable, uh, got tremendous, uh, news value once it does go pub public. And can you, and can you drop a name here or no? I, I, I can, I can, but that's a company got it, got where, it. you know, um, that's a company where, uh, you know, I could have probably profited from, a lot sooner if I would have uh, compromised my, what I believed was right, and and I'm mm -hmm. proud that I didn't. And and here we are, and you know, probably end up in a better spot at the end of the, you know, at the end of the story. But it's it's uh, I think it's important to know what what is meaningful to you, like those things I talked about, working with great people, people that you know you respect and admire. Um, is super important. And so knowing what is important to you is, is really important, right? Like you got <laughs> to do it. You got to do it. Got it. Got it. So yeah. it sounds to me when we talk about business ventures, strategic thinking, family life, it sounds to me like everything is coming back to parenting and everything is coming back to multi-generational, not wealth transfer, but knowledge transfer. It seems like that's the point. And, and I don't want to put those words in your mouth, but when you look at everything that you're doing, huge successes everywhere that you look, and I'm sure some failures too. Yep. Drew, what's the point of all of this? Well, I think the, you, you mentioned, you know, blueprint, or I kind of think about creating a blueprint for my sons. Like, um, I shared a video with you or, or you maybe seen the video of my eldest son, summer. Yeah. And yeah. I saw, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, you know, why did I create that video? Why did we go through the, the last six months that we went through? What an opportunity, right? Like the world, the world literally shut down. Everything stopped. And instead of having 20 tournaments all over North America, and four day a week practices and his personal training and everything else, it stopped. Everything stopped. Couldn't get into gyms. Uh, outdoor courts were locked out or the rims were taken off. Rims down. were taken off, yeah. So, hey, what an opportunity to create a blueprint for him and, and really, and both the boys, and to show them the importance of resilience, right? And so, right. Um, I'm giving that example because I think everything for me is a little bit of that, which is. You know, I don't know what my sons are ultimately going to do. They've got goals, and I actually think they can achieve the lofty goals that they have in their professional sporting career. But, you know, they're going to have different goals. It's going to be starting a family. It's going to be, you know, whatever it is. And I want them to have a blueprint. Because, frankly, you know, and I want to say this with respect to my parents, but I, they gave me different things. They didn't necessarily give me the blueprint for – what I, um, what I'm doing now, they gave me different, um, uh, opportunities to learn, but I really would have appreciated a little bit of a blueprint. Right. Um, <laughs> and so that's, you know, that's a big part of it. Why do I do what I do? I, I, I do believe you got to be happy. That's another thing. And frankly, I've, you know, there's been periods in my life where I wasn't happy. Um, and to me, what I do, the way I do it, um, is it, it makes me and, and therefore the people around me happy. And so that word is really important, right? You got to be happy, man. Uh, yeah. Going back to freedom, what is freedom? Well, a big part of freedom is, is, is being happy. So Totally. That, yeah. Wow. It's all so simple. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? 
yeah you know yeah, like yeah. we we overcome i mean humans are so stupid man um <laughs> yeah, that's great that's like it's funny how truth like people always say cliches yeah you know and 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 i grew up with a bunch of old old people like 70s 80s 90s yeah. and they would tell me cliches and i'd be like man after all this that's all you got <laughs> but like truth is fundamental truth is truth you truth know? is truth and and those cliches like if you really listen to them and you really oh, think about them man they can I, you know back to my upbringing like i think one of the things i'm so grateful for so i was I was essentially an only child. I, you know, kind of have an adopted uh, group of brothers. I've got a half brother, half sister, but I essentially grew up as an only only child. And so, and a lot of those years, I grew up at my grandparents' house, and we would go out to like dinner, you know, all the time. Swiss chalet, nothing fancy, right? Like Swiss chalet and stuff like that, uh, which is a well known place on the East Coast. And uh, what a gift, man! Yeah, right. Yeah. Folks in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 70s, and then even 80s, and just asking me questions and me asking them questions. I got to learn so much, probably, you know, in a way that has really benefited, you know, a lot of what the story's been so far and, and will be. I love it. I love it. Drew, we got to let you go here. I have three questions uh, that we've got from, from listeners here that I promised I would ask you. So I'm going to bang them off real quick. Okay. Um, First question we got here for you is, um, who is your favorite artist, and is it Fifty Cent specifically? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, I'm a really, really big fan of Biggie. Nice. So Fifty That's Cent is, is amazing, and he's done a lot of work with the brand. Um, but I grew up with Biggie, man, and that's you know, uh, that's somebody I really admire. I think the thing about artists, though, is like and maybe you've experienced this, some people just give you chills when they perform. Yeah. And I don't yeah. go to concerts. I'm not really a big concert guy. But I really admire Michael Jackson as well. Okay. You know, I'm not, that's not really my music. That's not really my thing. But the presence and the, like we were, it was a gift to watch that guy perform on TV or whatever. And I, you know, that's, that's pretty amazing. But Biggie's my guy. That's dope. Biggie's my guy. Pac's my guy. But yeah. I grew up with Fifth. I grew up with Fifth all the time. Read his book, Fifty a lot, all that stuff. Fifty was my alarm clock in uh, in New York. Every morning I got up oh. for a couple of years. I had Fifty playing, and it was uh, it was fun. So that is that is hype, man. That that was my people say, hey, are you excited to interview uh, Drew Green? And I was like, oh man, they've worked with Fifth, and I was yeah. hype about that, regardless of all the other stuff. Yeah. Anyways, uh, next question I got for you is, uh, what are the top three attributes that you look for in a new hire? Uh, curiosity. Hmm. So that, that, that when you were talking about, um, you know, the, your person you work with, um, his ability to ask questions, I think is a, a really big telltale sign of intelligence and, and, you know, being curious is super important to business because there's, like I said, you got a lot of problems to figure out every day. Um, uh, I think a degree of confidence, and I don't mean that by like kind of walking into the room and thinking you know it all, but, but just really, you know, some people will call it swag. Uh, I just call it confidence, right? Um, kind of knowing who you are already and, and, and being willing to, to improve is super important. And then the third biggest thing is, and you can't really figure this out, but I, I value this so much as loyalty. Hmm. So, you know, I think especially in this day and age, like everybody kind of expects it to happen in a week, in a month, in a year in two years, but great things take time. And, yeah. you know, if you can, you, if you can find a group to be loyal to, and that's loyal to you, I think that's a gift. So those are the three things. Curiosity, degree of confidence and loyalty. I love it. Last question for you. We are sitting here in September. The championship should have already been won. Uh, the Larry O'Brien Sharper trophy should have already been on his parades, but it's not. We got four, uh, teams left right now going on for the NBA, trying to fight for that NBA chip. Who's taking it home this year? Don't we have five? Don't we have what, five? What we got? Nuggets, we got uh, we got Heat, we got Heat, Boston, and we got Rockets, Lakers, right? No, we got uh, Heat, Celtics, Lakers, Denver, oh, is it Game Seven, Denver, and Clippers. Oh man! Yes, yeah, so we oh, got Game man, Seven that's crazy. coming up today. 
<laughs> so I think it's an okay. Easy who's line. bring Who's bringing home the chip? Who's bringing home the chip? Lakers, Lakers. Obviously, Lakers. LeBron, AD can't stop them. Can't stop them. Won't stop them. Can't stop them. Won't stop. <laughs> have you been a Lakers fan since the jump? I have. I have. I, my two teams. I'm kind of, you know, that being Canadian, your 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 gift is that you can. I can be a Yankees fan. I can be a Duke fan. Like you know, <laughs> I can be Patriots. Like how many Don't championships matter. have I won in you know thirty years? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, you know what, the Raptors are amazing, and I'm you know sad to see them uh, get out. But what a what an incredible couple of years, right? So yeah, absolutely. Okay, Drew, I love it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, before I let you go here, I, I wanted to uh, to thank you profusely for taking the time. That means the world to us because time is our most valuable asset. Absolutely, um, and I also. Uh, wanted to pass on uh, a hello from Mr. Spate from uh, North Pole Hoops, uh, <laughs> who, who, who who told me to give you a shout out. I was on the phone with him last week, and he was super excited. We were sitting down, so he wanted to say hello and and just send his love. Oh man, that guy's a real one, man. I, I appreciate that, and and I, I just enjoyed this conversation so much. So thank, thank you, you very, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Bite sized under an hour. I know you guys would like that. So. If you want to find out more about Indochino, go go do your research on on Drew and and go check out some of the other podcasts that he's been on as well. I'm sure we can link one in the pod uh, in the, in the show notes. The guy's business acumen is incredible. We didn't even have the time to get to it uh, too much in terms of actually the advanced, um, you know, more nuts and bolts of how business works. And but I mean that's all right. Go to the other podcast, check that out. I was so glad to get the philosophical story arc from Drew today, guys. Thank you so much uh, for for checking it out. I want to remind you guys because uh, we're still working with Nature of Work that if you want to go ahead and find a new baseline for what it means to be a high performer, uh, getting your technology and habits uh, in check, getting your sleep habits in check, uh, creating resiliency, allowing and scheduling time for creative thought. What can we actually do to make ourselves creative? What can we make, can we do to segment our focus blocks and, and actually get way more out of a day? Uh, go over to Nature of Work. They're doing this program called the Nature Work Foundations program. I've talked about it before. Um, it's the new baseline for anyone I'm working with. You got to have your technology habits in check. You got to be able to focus, monotask, and you got to be mindful. And you got to have you be able to win your day each day. These things matter. So, if that's something that you're interested in, a lot of our listeners are. Uh, there's a little community of us that uh, are kind of going through the program and and talking with each other. And if you want to hop in on that, shoot me a DM, ask me more about it. Uh, and if we have a good conversation about that, go over to uh, natureofwork.co and uh, at checkout, just add in the code ThinkSpace10. We'll put this in the show notes. That's code think space 10 and you'll get 10 percent off that program uh incredible team steve rio is a previous guest very excited to uh to be partnering up with him and offering this to our listeners that's all for me today guys i really appreciate you let's go next week i'll catch you guys back one more time again very exciting guest coming up so we'll preview that in a little bit have a great week ciao